All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Siegel. I'm the Director of Research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Africa Center, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's roundtable, Lessons for Africa from Columbia's Counterinsurgency Experience. So thank you, everybody, for coming out this, this Monday morning. On the African continent today, there are some 14 ongoing insurgencies. Many of these have lasted for years, some for decades. And this experience has led to a growing awareness on the continent that these internal conflicts can't be resolved through military means alone. Rather, they require whole of government efforts including, among other things, greater governance presence at the local level, um, socioeconomic initiatives in marginalized areas, uh, and a degree of trust from the local population towards government. Despite this awareness, models of successful counterinsurgency on the continent remain rare. So Colombia's remarkable turnaround in combating its insurgency is noteworthy. In the late 1990s, Colombia was considered to be among the most dangerous countries in the world. But since then, the number of homicides has been halved, numbers of kidnappings have dropped by 90%, and the insurgency has been rolled back, both in numbers of uh, fighters and in, and in terms of territory controlled. In fact, in 2014, 95% of the jurisdictions in, in Colombia reported no subversive activity. So our goal today with this roundtable is to use the occasion of the release of the book, uh, A Great Perhaps, Colombia, Conflict and Convergence, to take a look at Colombia's counterinsurgency experience over the last two decades and to reflect on the lessons that it holds um, for Africa. This book project has been a collaborative effort on, uh, between the government of Colombia and the Johannesburg-based Brenthurst Foundation. And so I've asked leaders of the two partners to say a few words to help frame today's analysis and to give us some understanding of why they decided to embark on this project. I'll start with uh, Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon. Ambassador Pinzon is the uh, Colombia ambassador to the United States, a position he's held since um, August of 2015. And prior to that, Ambassador Pinzon has held a number of senior policymaking roles within the Colombian government that have been directly responsible for the counterinsurgency efforts. These include um, stints as Vice Minister of Defense, Chief of Staff for President Juan Manuel Santos, and for four years, Minister of Defense. So, Ambassador Pizan, welcome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, all. It's a great honor to be uh, this morning here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I really appreciate you allow us here at the National Defense University to have the discussion and uh, appreciate for you to care on the efforts that have done, been done uh, in Colombia. Let me talk to you about this book that I guess some of you already got uh, the copy. First of all, to thank uh, Jonathan Oppenheimer and Brenner's Foundation for uh, them getting the interest in Colombia. And during my tenure as minister, they sent uh, an important mission of more than, I would say, 20, 25 experts, from, including people from the African Development Bank, uh, experts on defense and development fields from uh, seven, eight African countries, uh, former presidents of African nations like President Owasanjo and President Uoya, Nigeria and Burundi, and of course, a wonderful team of world experts on counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. 
That includes, of course, uh, David Kilcullen, whom I guess nobody needs to introduce, probably the most renowned expert in the world today on, on counterinsurgency uh, discussion. My good friend Greg Mills, who couldn't make it today, you know, he's in South Africa, a great expert on development and on economic uh, development itself. General Dickie Davis, who's here with us, a great British general who has a, a lot of experience in conflict, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and now uh, cares very much for what's going on in Africa. And our good friend David Spencer, who didn't make it today, I think he's in Colombia, by the way, and probably one of the most important experts on uh, Colombian uh, insurgency. So I really want to thank them for their time, the dedication, and um, for them coming to Colombia and writing with independence, with uh, a vision from the outside, and being able to put ideas that even for us is not so easy to describe. You know, as everybody's uh, challenges, when you're inside a problem, you don't see it the same way as others can see it. What they found is that Colombia could provide some lessons to other nations on what has happened in the past uh, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, it was well described. Colombia was probably the most violent country in the world. And we were able to transform that reality with a strong progress in security, making Colombia last year having the lowest homicide rate in almost 40 years, making Colombia a reduction on any security uh, metric that you can think of, allowing economic growth, so increasing private investment, foreign direct investment, and somehow reduction of unemployment, and sustain economic growth for a certain amount of time, almost a decade, certainly strong in the past five years, and consequences in social development, which matters even more. So a strong reduction in poverty, Poverty has been cut by half in a decade, and at the same time, uh, inequality has been uh, confronted as well, and there is a reduction on Gini coefficient that was stagnant in Colombia for more than 20 years. So all these create uh, a, a, an important reality, and that's probably why there are some features that were done in Colombia that can be discussed at the international level. Let me get a little bit on, the, on, on some issues of the book. First, of course, the, what the book describes is the security efforts, the military campaign, security campaign, military and police campaign, and of course, uh, the progress and the policies that led to uh, social and economic development. I think that's what is substantial about this book, is uh, uh, across uh, a cross-section analysis that allows us to think on the different policies, features, and activities that were necessary to move forward. Let me tell you that I strongly believe that here what we, what we find in this book is a very important recognition on how the armed forces perform in the field in Colombia, how Colombian armed forces were able to learn from different uh, experiences, how they were able to cooperate with the United States. There is a clear uh, vision that uh, you know, Plan Colombia and the US support was relevant onto this. How certain tactical capabilities were raised up in order to be able to confront the different kind of threats from special operations to intelligence to air mobility to riverine capabilities, to interdiction capabilities, uh, to go after cocaine uh, as a priority and the sources of uh, crime in a way, all this comes uh, clear into this book. From a strategic standpoint of view, I think that we can divide what happened in Colombia into three different times. The first time was the first period to recover territorial control from 1999 to 2006. From 2006, 7 to 2011, a big effort to take uh, the pressure into the camps of terrorism and uh, organized crime groups. 
from 2011 to 2015, in essence, to take over the territories in which, uh, for a long time, FARC, ELN, and others were permanently present, following lessons inside the system that were already created in different uh, times and years along this process. I think that's what, in general terms, we find. What is important to tell is that always what was thought was that the way to end the conflict in Colombia, of course, was by strengthening security capabilities, but at the end, to create the right kind of environment for political solution, for a peace agreement. And that exactly is what is going on as we speak. At a point, we can tell that when the efforts for peace start, Colombia was able to degrade terrorist organizations to almost 30% of what they were 10 and 15 years before. And that was what led to the condition of peace talks or for them to continue to be degraded. Since then, government has been involved into uh, an effort to move forward these peace talks, establishing four red lines that I believe have been very important. One, not to offer any kind of a ceasefire until the conditions are set in place. Second, a, not to accept any level of impunity. So this is the importance of creating a system of justice, of transitional justice, but at the end, not allowing war crimes or type of crime just to uh, be given away. Uh, thirdly, I believe it's very important to tell that the future of the armed forces was not into the discussion of the negotiation. And that was very important to guarantee that in the years to come, our forces could be and will be in place to confront the challenges that will come after uh, the current efforts. And uh, fourthly, as a very important element, is the idea that if we want a, a national reconciliation, this transition justice should work not only for members of armed organizations, but also for other state agents as a look forward for a absolute solution. That's where we are right now. But to summarize what I can tell you as of today is that this book reflects a little bit of what happened. What happened in Colombia was that the Colombian people, their leadership, their armed forces, were decisive to transform the reality. We transformed what we had, and we were able to bring this into a reality of a peace process. Peace in Colombia is happening from strength. Peace in Colombia is happening as consequence of military victory in the field, but also economic growth and social development. Now, what this book will find is that we will have challenges in the years to come, that we will need to continue to do what we have been doing well, that we will need to secure our country, that we will need to guarantee that development is going to be taken to the most isolated parts of the country, and that's how peace could be sustainable. I think that's an interesting feature that the experts will discuss today. It's not to me to continue to get engaged into that. Let me end my remarks by again thanking the group that uh, dedicated their time for this, by recognizing uh, the members of Colombian uh, military and police for their effort, sacrifice, and for allowing this long haul strategy for peace to uh, evolve, to happen, is because of them. And finally, uh, let me tell that uh, we will need to continue to work as hard as we have done. I don't think we can tell that the lessons that you find in Colombia are lessons you can transfer to any other country immediately. Uh, we are very humble to understand how difficult things are. We are very humble to understand that you need to keep trying to understand what is happening in every country with their own realities and characteristics. But at the same time, I think here there are some ideas and some features 
that if some others have similar problems, especially for, in our friends from Africa, maybe they can use some of these ideas uh, to be put in place with their own uh, flavor and with their own vision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pizan. Uh, I next like to introduce Jonathan Oppenheimer. Uh, Jonathan is the founder and board member of the Brent Hurst Foundation, which was established in 2003 to examine ways in which to drive Africa's economic growth. Since that time, the Brent Hurst Foundation has produced dozens of influential papers, reports, and books. And Jonathan has served on various Brent Hurst advisory committees to African governments, including most recently to Mozambique and Malawi. So Jonathan, thank you for being here this morning. Joe, thank you uh, so much. Thank you to the African Center, and thank you all for coming here today. Uh, it's, it's quite intimidating to follow someone as impressive as uh, Ambassador Pinzon and to truly talk about something which, in reality, I don't know a huge amount about. But I thought it was really important to try and put a little bit of context about why a, a little foundation in the sort of southern tip of Africa was focusing on Colombia. Of, uh, just a few thousand miles away, and why, why we were looking at security when we say that our real reason for existence is to enhance the economic growth and uh, prospects of, of Africa. And it really came, comes down to something that my great-grandfather said uh, in 1954, and that was uh, when we were a big business family. We remain a relatively big business family, but uh, we were leading... Uh, the biggest business in South Africa, and he said, and I, it's, it's at the very heart of the family's philosophy about the way we, we look at the world, he said, we're here to make a profit. Now, that might sound somewhat sort of difficult in this crazy world that we live in today, but we're here to make a profit. And he caveated that in, uh, with, I think, the most important statement possible, in such a way as to benefit the peoples and communities in which we operate. And that caveat really caused us as a family to spend a huge amount of time thinking about what were the necessary conditions for long-term sustainable economic success and long-term e sustainable job creation. And at its core is security. If you don't have security, you simply cannot have long-term success and prosperity. And it's on that basis that uh, the foundation, led by Greg Mills, has spent a huge t body of its work looking at trying to find the conditions and, uh, and the tools and the experiences necessary to understand how you create that kind of security. And Colombia stands out as an extraordinary example. It stands out as a homegrown example. And that, across the world today, is relatively unique. And so it was, in a sense, self-evident that uh, Greg would engage with David and, and Dickie and the rest of our panel of experts to try and understand what Colombia had done in this extraordinary journey. And they brought an enormous amount of skill, I think. The other thing that they brought, which uh, very few people mention, is they brought a passionate desire for first-hand experience. And so unlike many reports and books that are written from afar in some office, this was written from the field. And uh, it's not only in this particular example. The Brent Hurst Foundation has specialized in being in the field. And it's uh, something that I, I'm very, very proud of, the fact that they do first, first-hand research and generate their own data and as a consequence have I believe, a differentiated and alternative view on how uh, we have embraced the challenges that face us around the world. So the foundation set about trying to understand what was happening in Colombia, and a great perhaps is, in a sense, nearly a, a, an anecdotal, or not, sorry, yes, an anecdotally derived description of those findings. But the perhaps references the future, and the future remains extraordinarily challenging. 
The ambassador talked about having to having worked so hard in the past period and the need to continue to work. I would nearly suggest that in many respects the race preparations have been done. But we are confronted with or not only we, but, the, but Colombia, but we as, as, as a world are confronted with a more difficult challenge. And that difficult challenge is winning the peace. And what does winning the peace actually mean? And that is really where the foundation uh, places its mind and, and tries to understand. And if I can just have a, a very brief punt about the foundation's work, we have just started a new project on, on mega cities, or not only mega cities, but cities in the African context recognizing that these are the most likely sources for instability on the continent in the next period, and trying to understand what conditions will prevent that social instability and create prosperity. And our thesis is that it is economic growth, an economic growth that uplifts all the individuals in that community at a level such that disposable income across the job-seeking population is on average rising and when broken into different component parts is also rising. And that ultimately is a challenge which is extraordinarily difficult. And I would argue the perhaps of the great perhaps is going to be achieving that challenge, particularly in a world which is, and I think we all have lived in it post the 2008 financial crisis, uncertain and difficult I think the IMF just downgraded global growth. Isn't that right? I believe so, but I mean, if they haven't, they will shortly, I'm sure. And uh, these, the, every time that happens, the, the, the bar is just raised in terms of the challenges that we face. And uh, this sort of community, I believe, has a really, really important role to play in thinking about and informing the strategic conversation that needs to take place not only in Colombia or in South Africa or across the African continent, but in places like Washington here. Because collectively, if we try and fight this fight with one hand tied behind our back, we will lose. And the social instability and the unrest that that will create is a penalty or, or a punishment that none of us, I believe, should welcome. Actually, that's the wrong way around. We should work actively passionately to make sure that it doesn't happen. And that does mean that we need to examine and be very forthright and clear in understanding what are the levers that are available to us to drive the necessary wealth creation to secure that stability. So without really uh, uh, much more, I think just to, to reiterate, uh, Colombia stood as an extraordinary example to us of a domestically resolved with international partners uh, understanding of how to engage with uh, a, a conflict and, and insecurity. And uh, to date, I think, so you, through to, to the government of Colombia, but you and your role as Minister of Defense, Ambassador, was have fought a very, very astute and tactically savvy engagement where you have brought pressure to bear on the right people to force with an understanding that that was the job at hand to force everybody to the negotiating table as i said before i fear i fear that the biggest challenge yet remains and that will be winning the peace and i think that that is going to be a challenge that not only colombia but all emerging markets face and particularly africa which has the fastest growing population in the world so Without further ado, Joe, I'll, I'll hand back to you, but thank you all. I hope that gives you some context about why this little foundation at the southern end of the continent of Africa chose to spend its time in Colombia. It has been an extraordinarily beneficial and, and advantageous learning experience for us, and we thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. And so now we'll move um, to the panel part of our program today. Um, and uh, we'll have each of the panelists speak for roughly 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll open it up for questions and comments from those in attendance today. We have a, a relatively large panel. And so what we're going to do is uh, do the introductions one by one as we go through them. 
Uh, so we'll get right into the meat of the discussion. And uh, we're, we're um, fortunate this morning to have two of the book's four authors with us. As was mentioned, uh, Greg uh, Mills from the Brenthurst Foundation and David Spencer from the Perry Center for uh, Hemispheric and Defense Studies here at the National Defense University can't be here because they're out of the country. Um, but we do have with us, um, to my right, uh, Major General Dickie Davis uh, as one of the authors. And General Davis is an associate uh, at the Brentford, Brenthurst Foundation and the managing director of Nant Enterprises with extensive experience in Sub-Saharan Africa. He served for 31 years in the British Army, reaching the rank of Major General. And his service included several tours in Afghanistan, where he commanded the first UK provincial reconstruction team in Mazar al-Sharif. He led the ISAF reconstruction and, and development effort and was chief of staff of the regional command south. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dickie. Thank you, good morning. Thank you and good morning. Um, first of all, I think I should say that, that having just recently retired from the army, I found this project extremely stimulating. Um, and I really thank uh, the ambassador from Colombia for all the support that we received and for Jonathan to back what at times seemed a bit of a crazy idea. Uh, and I, I learned a huge amount and perhaps my reflection at the end is, hmm, maybe I wish I'd known this 31 years ago before I embarked on my military career. Um, I, I thought I would cover in my short slot a little bit about capability development and, and the five, um, rather than lessons, I would describe them as observations that we would pick out from the campaign and wrote about in the conclusion. I think the thing that uh, struck me as I started to study uh, the campaign in Colombia was the boring topic of capability development. Now, I, I was interested in this because I'd spent... Uh, more than two years as the Director of Plans of Land Forces in the, in the UK, uh, as we went through the effects of the first effects of the financial crisis in 2007 and 2009. So I know how painful uh, making the books and the capability balance is. And what struck me about the Colombian experience is, you know, here you had a force that was configured for the external defence of the country. Uh, and if you look at the Air Force at the start of the campaign, it was equipped with everything you would expect an Air Force that is about defending the airspace of the country would have fast jets, all that sort of capability. And yet the seriousness of the crisis had forced some really, really tough decisions and some really interesting solutions. So you look at the Colombian Air Force today and it has a huge aviation wing designed to support jungle operations it has invested wisely in, in perhaps low-tech aircraft to design to support what they need. And it has actually reconfigured where the air bases sit in the country so as to ensure there's proper coverage of the country as a whole rather than just the borders. And actually, if you get out your, you know, your eight defence lines of development and begin to look at what the Colombians did over the course of the campaign, it struck me that it was a marvellous, it worked example of true capability development delivered by, an, you know, derived against an urgent threat. And I felt that needed some exposure because as you, as you sit in various parts of Africa, you can see the same difficulties, constrained defence budgets, urgently, uh, urgent or emerging security problems, and are wrestling with what is this armed force for? Is it for the external defence of the country? Is it for dealing with a new and emerging um, threat? So I thought there was a huge amount to come out of that. Turning to the, the sort of key observations, I mean, I, uh, Jonathan's already touched on really what we, was our first, um, which was that security is the door through which much else follows. You know, you could argue, and, and Dave puts this much more eloquently than I would, you know, how much of the first X percent it is. But without security, you cannot achieve all of those um, other issues. So of the observations, our first observation from Colombia was actually what drove change was getting the politics right. And of course, what's slightly depressing is how long that took. You know, when Dave Spencer was writing the, the history chapter of the book, you know, he has a debate with himself, which he's written on paper, you know, where do you start? Do you start with Plan Colombia? 
you know, at the end of the 1990s? Do you start with the formation of the FARC in 1964, or do you start with uh, the earlier periods of violence? And actually, you look at all of that, and it takes a very, very long time to get to a position <coughs> where you have a man political mandate for, for driving tough security, and the sort of planets begin to align. And actually, before that, when the will wasn't there, you just couldn't get that traction. And I think that leads me neatly on to our second observation. And I wrote the chapter that compares uh, the war in Colombia with uh, Malaya and Afghanistan. And there'll clearly be a debate about which campaigns we chose to compare it with. You know, why didn't you choose another Latin American campaign? Um, but what was very clear from the comparison of both Colombia and Malaya is actually you need a man with a mandate and you need a plan. Now, that sounds like the blindingly obvious but actually, you can study an awful lot of counterinsurgency campaigns where that has not been the case and the outcome has not been successful. And yet you see both of that in Malaya uh, and in uh, Colombia. Which leads us neatly on to the third observation, which is one of ownership. Um, Greg uh, Mills, the director of the foundation, came out to Afghanistan in 2006 as the lead of the commander of ISAF's think tank. Uh, and uh, it was... For him, a partially frustrating experience because I don't think we military had quite worked out how to gear a think tank into the military system. And when he left, he sort of went, he went on a search which probably had the strap line, there has to be a better way. And that's why he ended up in Colombia. Um, and the big difference, of course, between Iraq and Afghanistan and Colombia is one of campaign ownership. And here in Colombia, you have had a, a government, a people, a leader who have owned the campaign personally and therefore have driven its execution, which clearly was not the case uh, in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, which is why we felt this campaign deserved exposure because it was not a third-party counterinsurgency. A part of that ownership is something that is quite difficult to accept, but it's absolutely there in this campaign, and that is that these sort of events are too important just to be left to the military. It is not just a military problem. It has to be a whole cross-government approach. Uh, and, of course, the military in the early days, as security is difficult, have a very, very important role. But without that cross-government approach, you don't begin to tackle the challenge that comes next, the how do you deliver the peace. Which sort of takes us into the much more difficult area of the great perhaps, which is actually you have to offer an alternative to the political economy of war. And as you sit in Johannesburg pondering the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in the Central African Republic, how do you break that cycle? How do you get rid of the political economy of war and get people back into a more normal space? Now, there have been some gains in Colombia. I think it was our view that actually those gains are fragile and could be easily reversed. And I think they represent some of the challenges of the next period that our front two speakers um, spoke about. Um, and the last pointer was really, this is a long-term business. You know, exiting a cycle of conflict takes time and it takes continuity of approach. And one of the things that struck us about this campaign is actually from the period where the peace process under Pastrana fails, is you actually have remarkable continuity of approach across different administrations. And that allows long-term development and long-term plans to take root. Uh, and I think gets us um, to the space where we are today. So my final word would be actually our conclusion is that these campaigns are much more about hard work, perspiration, long-term approach. And actually, this is not a book about finding silver bullets. It's about recording some of that journey. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dickie. Um, you packed in a lot there in your, in your short uh, stint. And he raises points uh, about the importance of politics in dealing with counterinsurgencies. It, um, it's notable that he starts with the importance of getting the politics right and, and looking at the problem as the challenge of overcoming the, pol the political economy of war. Um, uh, Dickie also brings out, I think, a really relevant point that uh, 
um, applies both to the Colombian context and to many of the African uh, realities that we look at in terms of the duration of these uh, insurgencies and how do you endure, how do you um, maintain that continuity of effort to be successful. Um, we're going to turn now to um, a Colombian perspective, and for that we have uh, General Sergio Mantilla, who served for 41 years as, in the Colombian Army, and from 2011 to 2013, he held the role of Colombia's Army Commander, and this came during the critical implementation phase of the Sword of Honor counterinsurgency campaign. Among other command roles, General Montilla commanded the Decisive Action Force, the 7th Division, the Caribbean Joint Command, and the 3rd Colombian Infantry Battalion in Sinai, Egypt. General Montilla was also a senior defense attache at the Colombian Embassy here in Washington. And he holds master's degrees from the National Defense University here, uh, as well as with the Colombian War School. General Matia. Hey, thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, as always, it's a great pleasure to be in my campus in my school. I'm a graduate of a mighty ICAF. I understand that the name changed, but uh, for me it's ICAF. It's going to be ICAF, whatever. Mighty ICAF. We beat that year uh, national. Uh, General Asprilla is from is, is a graduate from national. We beat you. Uh, thinking what to say is my my first take, my first uh, uh, lesson from the long uh, Colombian conflict. It is that uh, you can win it, and we won it. We won the war in Colombia in the field. Uh, the military portion was won. Uh, we, through all the efforts of the forces, the police, the government, the economy, the Colombians, everyone within the country, our friends here in the States, our friends in Europe, we defeated the enemy. It's uh, that simple. Uh, but that was the military portion of it. Now, as already been explained by the ambassador and the, and the other members already, it is a, another difficult part to continue. Uh, but th that's an, a, another story. The good news is military, you can defeat it without breaking the country, without breaking the institution of the, of the country, within the, the democracy boundaries imposed in, in today's world, you could do it. So that's the first lesson, uh, I, I think. The second lesson is that, uh, as Dickie already mentioned, is you need a plan. The plan in our case was developed around uh, 1998, uh, around the year 2000. So it makes it a plan for the uh, last 16, 17 years, uh, depending on how you count. And that plan, uh, uh, before that, we didn't have a, a concerted plan, an integrated plan. It was the efforts of some independent units. It was the effort, back then we already had division headquarters, so the divisions were uh, doing what they could, uh, but we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the manpower, we didn't have the idea, and the effort was not concentrated, was not led uh, from the top. So the beauty of the plan is that uh, it got all the elements that we had uh, at our disposal, disposable to us, and we concentrated those, and we had a main effort within the country. And the main effort is uh, in the South. It's been for many years in the South. But at the beginning, it was the, the plan, the first phase of the plan was to get the country out of the chokehold that the uh, FARC had, uh, around the, 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 the capital city back then. If you visited uh, Colombia and you were an American, you couldn't go farther away than the uh, 100th Street in the north of the city. Because if you left the city, or good chances, you're going to be kidnapped and spend a little bit of time in, in, in the jungle. Uh, so the first part of the plan was to break that stranglehold 
around the, the, the mind of the Colombians all over the country and uh, to give us a sense of liberty, of uh, ownership of our country that you could move within the roads of our country. Uh, so the psychological, psychological effect was really great uh, because we started to believe that we could do it. Now, uh, they, they will teach you in this school everywhere that a good plan needs resources. You cannot make a plan in your mind or in paper and, and present it to the guys that are going, and girls that are going to develop the plan without the resources. So resources came by. And then Plan Colombia came by. And then we, back then, I was a battalion commander, and we did, the army had only like four Russian helicopters to move around Colombia. It was only like four or five helicopters, no more than that. So, Plan Colombia, now here comes the uh, cavalry, and uh, we have helicopters now. Uh, we have, uh, an, 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 and because of the change in psychology, the government could get the money needed to buy us all those resources. Uh, manpower, intelligence, intelligence platforms, uh, helicopters, planes, uh, all kinds of uh, needed stuff, very really needed uh, uh, night vision equipment, all, 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 all the elements of a good plan. Now, the first phase was to change the psychological, psychological attitude to uh, 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 stop the enemy on their tracks and uh, to change the balance within the forces, within, with, within the country. The second phase was to uh, get the fight deep into the jungle, deep into the mountains, to bring the fight to the enemy. And uh, that's a great success. It's the uh, high-value target uh, campaign, the, uh, the efforts of uh, our mighty Air Force, the efforts of our great Navy, and of course, the, uh, the uh, superb efforts of the Army and the police. Uh, the Army and the police. And uh, so we got the elements, we got the troops, we moved. When I joined the army, the army was 35,000 soldiers within the country. Now, until a couple of years ago, during uh, Mr. Pinson's time as minister, we uh, grew the last 5,000 soldiers within the army to just reach close to 250,000 soldiers. So those elements allowed us uh, uh, to get all these gains to, the re to reduce the enemy Thirty-five percent. Now, for the last years of the campaigns, we have been uh, clearing completely, uh, uh, cleaning zones, and maintaining those gains because you need soldiers, you need troops, you need good infantry, good soldiers to keep the terrain, to keep your gains. Uh, so that will be the second lesson: a plan and the resources. And the third lesson already mentioned is that uh, you cannot bring a template. You cannot bring uh, whatever is fashionable, whatever is uh, mighty U.S. do, I'm using that word too much, that uh, the U.S. uses because the U.S. have the money and resources. We don't have, so we cannot copy the model of another country. We have to develop our own. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, we, we, we are not really joined in the sense uh, that you understand here in, in the States and in, in the UK and in other countries, but we do conduct joint operations. And we are good at conducting joint operations. And the results are there to, to, to prove that we understand the concept, although we don't have yet the resources or the uh, peace of mind to change our organization into the future. That will be the task for the guys uh, ahead, of us, uh, ahead of us, uh, the young officers in, in all the forces. That will be in the future, eventually. Uh, but but you, don't have to, you, you don't have to go and copy any model and, and say this, this was good here, this was good here, this was good here. You have to sit down, talk to your people, and then develop your own initiatives, develop them and follow them through. So those will be my, my opening comments. Thank you.
Thank you very much, General Montilla. And uh, General Montilla makes the point that, uh, that we shouldn't lose, that the, the Colombian effort was done under a democratic framework. And that's a really important uh, lens to think about in an African context. He makes the point that that is part of what helped to mobilize the popular support, the momentum, the change psychology that uh, led to the, the successes that the Colombians realized. He re 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 reiterates the, plan, the point about um, a plan that Dickey had made and that this plan had to be uh, resourced. And in that, in that process, the capability of the Colombian forces grew substantially uh, over that time, a plan that was uh, owned and adapted um, to the Colombians' uh, unique circumstances. Our third speaker um, uh, is another author of the book. Uh, David Kilcullen is a leading thinker on counterinsurgency and military strategy, and he is the author of several highly acclaimed books on counterinsurgency. He was formerly senior counterinsurgency advisor to General David Petraeus in Iraq and to the NATO Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. He is currently chairman of Ceres Associates and is a senior fellow at the New American Foundation. Um, uh, Dr. Kilcullen uh, served in the uh, Australian Armed Forces and um, uh, within his various institutional affiliations, he has served, uh, among other places, in Southeast Asia, Colombia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. David? Thank you to the Foundation and uh, to, to the Government of Colombia for uh, helping us put the, the research together. Um, I go back to something that Dickie said earlier, um, and I, I want to quote the probably the most important counterinsurgency advisor that no one's ever heard of, John Paul Van, who was uh, one of the key players in Vietnam, who was once asked, how important is security to what we're trying to do in Vietnam? Is it 10% of the problem or 90%? And he said, look, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you it's either the first 10% or it's the first 90%. Because if we don't get that right, it doesn't really matter what else we're planning to do. And Colombia, I think, right now is a great example of a country that has got the first 10% or the first 90% correct and has succeeded in achieving the military defeat of a very large, very well-organized and long-standing insurgency, and that's remarkably unusual and a very important achievement uh, globally. But now we find ourselves at a very complex inflection point where we have to translate progress on the battlefield into long-term sustainable political outcomes. And that classically is the most difficult part of any uh, insurgency or counterinsurgency environment. So let me talk briefly about some of the issues that I think confront uh, Colombia at this inflection point. And in my chapter in the book, I talk about the distinction between counter guerrilla warfare and counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency is a holistic whole of government effort that's designed to confront every aspect of an insurgency. Counter guerrilla warfare is what the security forces do as part of that effort to target the military element of the insurgency only. And I focus very heavily on that piece of uh, the history of the conflict uh, in what I've written. Um, the reason I did that is because uh, it's one of the areas where we see the clearest evidence of what I've called the territorial logic of stalemate in Colombia. If you draw a line down the middle of the map of Colombia on the eastern side of Bogota, uh, right on the edge of the, of the major mountain ranges that cover the western third of the country, you're actually dividing Colombia into two, what amounts to different countries. One is a democracy of long standing, 200 years old, with an industrialized, urbanized, uh, very educated, very capable population. And something like 90% of the population of Colombia lives west of that line between the edge of the mountains uh, and the sea. To the eastern side of that line, only about 5% of the country's population lives, and it's a periphery that is underdeveloped, has traditionally been quite unequal, and has been excluded 
politically and marginalized economically from the life of the country. And that creates a very interesting dynamic in Colombia. When the government is threatened on its own, ter on its own turf, the developed uh, middle-income democracy of the area to the west of the country, it's virtually unbeatable by an insurgency. And there's, it's almost impossible to, ima to imagine a circumstance in which a rural guerrilla movement can succeed in overthrowing the government on its own turf. But when the government tries to advance into that very underpopulated, remote, vast area in the east of the country, it's very, very hard to stamp out the last remaining element of a determined insurgency. And so that means that for 200 years, conflict has seesawed back and forth between uh, bandits or small guerrilla groups in the rural environment who've ne never succeeded in threatening the state's existence uh, and uh, the, the government, which has never succeeded in uh, fully pacifying the countryside. So the critical turning point in the conflict on the military side happened in 1992 and 1993, when the FARC, on the back of very significant uh, changes at the end of the Cold War, decided to uh, adopt a, a new form, a new operating form, a new, new form of operations, and essentially to go into a war of movement to create a pseudo-conventional force and try to encircle the cities and overthrow the state. And that prompted, uh, as General Mantilla has said, it prompted a crisis in the late 1990s where people couldn't travel outside the cities, there was a rash of assassination and kidnapping, the heart of the country was threatened really for the first time since the beginning of the FARC uprising in the 1960s. And that provoked a national crisis that led to an extraordinarily successful series of military operations that have happened since then, that pushed the FARC out of that heartland of Colombia, back into the rural periphery, regained control of the cities, regained control of Colombia's national life, and brought the FARC to the peace table. But now the dynamic that we find is almost that dynamic of stalemate, but in reverse, because now the political uh, commitment on the part of ordinary Colombians to sustain the effort has started to diminish. Now that you're not at risk of being kidnapped if you go outside a major city, most Colombians are just, well, can we just get back to normal now? Can we just end the conflict? By, an effort, by definition, in a, a counterinsurgency environment, once you've ended the military part of the conflict, you cannot go back to normal because that's what brought about the conflict in the first place. You actually have to make significant political and economic changes, which means you need to translate battlefield success uh, into sustainable political progress. Um, a couple of observations on that, and then I want to talk briefly about uh, US assistance. The first one is that uh, in, in the FARC, Colombia is confronting an enemy that believes in the combination of all forms of struggle. The idea that there's an economic, a political, a military, and an informational dynamic to the conflict. And when that enemy is threatened in one domain, it simply modifies its operations and emphasizes another in order to continue moving forward towards its strategic goals. So what that means is that the peace process for the FARC is not the end of the conflict. It's simply a shift into a different model or a different mode of struggle. Political, urban asymmetric, manipulation of social movements and protests, uh, the exploitation of a resurgent drug cultivation, a variety of means to basically regain at the peace table what they've lost on the battlefield over the past 10 to 15 years. And so if you're dealing with an enemy that adopts that strategy, the worst thing you can do is to think that the conflict is over once the fighting is finished. In fact, in many ways, the most important phase of the struggle with the FARC is only just uh, beginning. Um, the second uh, observation would be that uh, US in particular, but foreign countries that engage in assistance to counterinsurgency environments typically are quite narcissistic about our assistance. We tend to think that any progress that was achieved was because of what we did. Uh, and I would emphasize a couple of things with respect to Colombia. Firstly, 
The first United States Special Operations Team to deploy to Colombia was in 1959. Uh, and so not only is that a very, very long-term engagement and partnership between the United States and Colombia, for most of the life of that partnership, it didn't generate any very significant operational result. The change in Colombia happened not because of uh, external assistance, but because of a political shift and a focus on, uh, again, as General Mantia said, getting the politics right and achieving progress on the basic uh, drivers of the insurgency. And all of that came from Colombians. And so it was a matter of local talent, local ownership, uh, human capital in Colombia, assisted and enabled, to be sure, by outsiders, not just the United States, but also others. Uh, but just getting that foreign assistance piece right wasn't enough to turn the tide. It had to come from uh, Colombians themselves. Um, and that leads to my, my final point, which is about application to Africa. Um, Africa is, well, Colombia is not one country, as I've just said. It's really uh, a well-developed, democratic, industrialized country surrounded by uh, a much different country. Africa, of course, is also not one country. It's more than 50 countries with enormous variation between them and indeed within each country. So I think we need to be very careful about templating or copying lessons from one conflict to another. But I think we can see some principles. Um, one of those principles is that governments have to focus on what in the Colombian context, the Colombian government calls governability, making environments able to be governed. And that means extending the reach of government. It means creating non-corrupt governance mechanisms at the local level. And very importantly, it involves creating permanent presence rather than just episodic uh, visits or, or raids uh, by government forces into the periphery of the country. So living in the environment where you seek to govern and creating a, a set of institutions that enable government to take place. The second, again, uh, Colombian idea is the idea of institutionalization, creating at the local level institutions that people trust security institutions, but also legal and economic and political institutions in order to try to uh, cement and embed the relationship between the government and the population. Um, and I think in many African contexts, that's, in, if anything, more difficult than the military side of the problem. And then the third element, which is um, back to what General Davis, what Dickie said at the beginning, uh, is getting the military capability right to enable a relatively small military to cover vast distances, to apply very carefully targeted uh, kinetic action against carefully discriminated targets, and then to ensure that that results in uh, long-term stability and security for the population involved. Uh, I would argue, again, as I said at the beginning, that Colombia has got the first 10% or the first 90%, depending on how you uh, define the problem, right. And that's an enormous achievement that very few countries globally can claim, the military defeat of a sustained insurgency. Now, at this very complex inflection point, uh, the most important challenge uh, is yet to come, and that's to ensure that Colombia doesn't lose at the peace table what it's gained on the battlefield, and that we can translate military success uh, in combat into long-term sustainable political progress. Thank you, David. Uh, you've given us a lot that uh, we can think about and we'll certainly be coming back to. Um, interesting listening to you. Um, so much of the focus is on the institutionalization challenges involved rather than any particular set of tactics um, uh, that, uh, you know, that might be pursued. And uh, very much uh, intertwining the political economy of stabilization against the insurgent challenges that are out there and recognizing that the goal isn't just to return this to the status quo before conflict, but how do you move past what the drivers of that conflict are towards a sustainable peace? Um, for our last panelist, um, we'll turn to uh, David Ucko, who was not part of the book project. And I asked him to uh, participate to provide us an independent perspective on some of the lessons from Colombia and what their potential applications to Africa might be. 
Uh, David is an associate professor at the College of International Security Affairs here at uh, National Defense University. And he is also um, an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University and the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. He's author of several books on counterinsurgency. And uh, in previous roles, he has uh, had affiliations with uh, the German Stiftung uh, SWP, RAND, um, the uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies, and also uh, NDU's uh, um, uh, uh, International INSS. So, uh, David, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, and also thank you for this opportunity to comment on this book. Uh, I'm not a, an author, as you mentioned, not even of a chapter, but I will say that this is a book that uh, needed writing. I've been struck uh, in my studies of counterinsurgency of how few lessons have been drawn from the really uh, uh, successful case of Colombia. Of course, everything is relative in this world, but in a very storied record of counterinsurgency campaigns, Colombia stands out as an extremely rich case study. And I think, I mean, we actually, in, in the College of International Security Affairs, use the Colombian case to inform campaign plans and strategies for conflict resolution all over the world. So. This very much speaks to, to that, uh, um, that approach. Um, an, another, um, I think, uh, uh, statement that needs to be made about this book is that whereas in most efforts at comparing two different campaigns or lifting a strategy from one and putting it somewhere else, critiquing it is somewhat like shooting fish in a barrel because the authors tend to be so blind to the political context and specific drivers that enabled whatever success one can speak of in case A, and then blindly press it onto case B. Uh, this is very much, and I emphasize this, very much an exception to that rule. And I think you, you get that sense just from listening to the speakers today, uh, authors and practitioners who have a keen understanding of the political, uh, political um, circumstances in Colombia and are very modest indeed about seeking to replicate them elsewhere, but are nonetheless convinced that there is something here uh, that we can learn from. I'm just going to focus uh, a little bit on what I see as uh, some of the lessons and caveats in, in, in uh, looking at Colombia. Um, and then I look forward to uh, concluding rather quickly so we can have a, a question and answer and sort of discussion afterwards. Um, the first comment I'd like to make is that one of the key lessons uh, from this case, I think, is the government's focus on legitimacy. Now, I know that sounds like a tired cliche for anyone who's uh, looked at counterinsurgency literature, but it is really central, and I'll try to explain why. With a group like FARC, it would be tempting to say that the people have been taken out of the equation, because, of course, FARC's adaptation into more of a narco-trafficking group suggests that the sort of Maoist mass mobilization is not taking place. But I think what's clear from this case is that whereas the group may not need the people, and we see this also, of course, with Boko Haram, the government needs the people. It is impossible to win this without the government, hence Uribe's focus on a democratic security policy. So by looking at the center of gravity here as the relationship between the government and the people, I think the response really took off on the right foot. Um, now, what does legitim legitimacy mean? Uh, it certainly means far more than just being liked or just being popular. And I think uh, that's where we see the role of security. It is really achieving legitimacy through security uh, that matters. And that is, I think, the, the key impetus for the democratic security policy that was launched in 2002. Uh, and that, of course, requires a strong military. It requires a very strong security sector. Uh, and, and that's also where we find one of the first difficulties in exporting this particular type of strategy to many African uh, countries dealing with um, conflict today. Because, of course, in more uh, impoverished nations or those who are reliant on World Bank loans or conditionality, uh, not least in the security sector, having that strong military or be able to really uh, export security for the people becomes very difficult indeed. Um, one of the workarounds for Colombia, of course, was by getting the people involved. Uh, and that, I think, goes beyond what I just said about legitimacy. It also has a very pragmatic uh, dimension to it. The military simply can't do it all by itself. How do you cover 
uh, a country the size and terrain of Colombia with sort of a security blanket. Uh, when you have a, a finite, a necessarily finite um, uh, military and security sector. Well, what you see, and I think this is really one of the key lessons from, from the early years of the Colombian counterinsurgency campaign, is this popular mobilization of uh, village defense forces, or as they call them, the uh, soldados de mi pueblo, in those areas affected by FARC. Now, what does this mean? Well, much like in, in many other conflicts, you see a um, devolution of security responsibilities to the local level and, and the rising up of so, uh, village security forces, uh, you can call them paramilitaries, so of course, uh, uh, that word has a different meaning in the Colombian context. Um, but you, folks, I'm in Sierra Leone, you had the CDF, and you see vigilantes in Nigeria and so on. It, it, study after study finds that these types of local security forces are indispensable to the security that we've heard matters so much in counterinsurgency. The problem that we see again and again is that those local security forces are typically operating outside of the government's overview uh, and, and uh, control. So what you have instead then is a splintering of coercive capabilities that operates very much against the monopoly and the use of force that any sovereign state should enjoy. It is for that reason quite spectacular and certainly remarkable that the Colombian government was able to incorporate its civil defense forces within the command and control of its regular armed forces. They had essentially a uniformed uh, officer who would control and oversee and uh, also then um, lead each platoon that was stood up. Now, how is that possible? How could Colombia do that when it's something that so many other governments struggling with conflict uh, uh, fail to do so? Well, I think it required mobilization again. It required a sense of shared, a shared vision for the future and also a sense that the government was nonetheless legitimate and that the people's best bet was to side with it. Uh, we can't really get away from that starting point, hence why I started with it. Um, a third uh, lesson that needs to come out of this particular case relates to specialization. Uh, that is to say, developing a very careful estimate of the situation, highlighting the exact capabilities and threats of the group that you're countering, and then developing your own capabilities to counter those specific capabilities. I mean, that sounds obvious again, but it's something that doesn't always happen. Uh, militaries are typically not well tailored to conduct internal security operations in a sort of counterinsurgency campaign. But what you find in Colombia is a development of specific capabilities in niche um, um, uh, areas to combat the exact uh, uh, strategy of the threat group. So, for example, just to bring one thing out, and I think it speaks to the level of detail that was applied really across the board, uh, given the chokehold that FARC had at the tr uh, in, within the transport infrastructure, the government then developed this meteor plan involving toll booth monitoring, road security centers, road guards, uh, mobile judiciary units to uh, effectuate uh, quick justice uh, within uh, the, uh, uh, across the country, air monitoring, all of these sort of sub-campaigns within a broader program that really targeted the exact operational art of the adversary. That level of analytical know-how and the ability to translate that into very specific programs is something that I think most governments struggle with. And I think this is a case study in how it's done. And luckily, of course, what the Colombian government did is also written down as well documented, at least in Spanish, but often also in English, and, and therefore provides a particularly helpful guide for other governments struggling with similar challenges. Other Examples of that level of specialization involve the Interior Ministry's program for the protection of persons at risk to target the very high threat of assassinations during this time, or the special high mountain battalions that were required to block the mobility corridors that FARC were threatening the capital through, or the mobile brigades able to clear and hold in a sustained manner and therefore establish what David Kilcullen mentioned as that sustained presence in the sort of periphery. Um, so specialization, again, uh, you know, when you, when you remove it from its context, it sounds like a platitude, but I think it really holds the key to something quite important about the prosecution of these types of campaigns. Fourthly, um, one of the key uh, uh, best practices, if I, if I may call it that, that emerges in this case is 
the, the importance of not confusing military gains with political victory. And this is something that our, our previous speakers have uh, talked about. Uh, General Carlos Espina, whom I'm honored to say is a close colleague of mine, uh, he always speaks of the danger and counterinsurgency of uh, the tactification of the strategy. That is to say, presenting uh, tactical victories, tactical gains as strategic endpoints in and of themselves. The key, of course, is that the security forces provide a shield behind which politics can take place. And the Colombian government's response, I think from 2002 onwards, was very much cognizant of that fact. So what they realized, in other words, is that war is about politics. And politics is, of course, as we know, very local. So I think any attempt to learn from this needs to look quite carefully at how governance has been reestablished in those parts of the country where the state formerly was all but lacking. And that is, of course, through security councils at the local level, councils of governance, and basically taking the best face of the state out to the people and getting the people involved in it. It's essentially reestablishing a social construct all while being shot at. So tremendously difficult and, and therefore also a, a very interesting case in its successful prosecution. But I think we also need to go further because it wasn't just about getting the local people part of the equation, it's also about getting the whole of the government in, uh, to play its part. And in a sense, to go even further, a whole of society effort. For well, how else can we explain the success of the war tax whereby uh, the Colum Colombian government has actually you know, essentially financed this? It requires a, a shared sense of responsibility, a shared view of the urgency of the cause, and a shared commitment to sacrifice and to build towards a better tomorrow. I think it's fascinating, and I often show my students, the matrix that the Colombian government has established for the responsibilities of the various ministries and agencies all across the government in their particular role in the struggle. That is to say, this is not just a military effort, it's not just a security sector effort, it is truly a, all a government effort. And whereas that sounds like a cliche, again, we need to wonder why it became a cliche, because it certainly, historically speaking, I think, um, reveals a lot about how to proceed and how to prevail in these difficult uh, situations. Just want to conclude with one or two caveats uh, that we should probably bear in mind before we try to replicate this uh, elsewhere. First, of course, is America's investment in Colombia. Uh, now, I, I would not want to suggest in any way that this uh, victory, if we may call it that, or certainly the progress, is made in America. This is a, a, a Colombian a, a homemade effort that US, fortunately, was able to support. But if you compare that situation to most African states that are struggling with internal security challenges, they don't have that uh, advantage. Uh, I mean, if you are struggling with aid dependence, conditionality, and not least in the security sector, it might be difficult to justify ramping up of the security sector in the way that happened in Colombia in the last 15 years. Notably, whereas any conflict zone in Africa will typically attract a UN peacekeeping operation, that never happened in Colombia. In fact, I don't think it was ever even discussed as a remote possibility. That speaks again to the level of capacity and capability that was inherent within the Colombian state, vis-a-vis -vis what you find typically in many African conflict zones. Um, it also is important to remember that the US and Colombia had very long-standing and good relations. Building partnership capacity is not something that we do particularly well. In this case, it helped that Colombia and the United States had deployed together in Korea, fought together, and I think established very serious and uh, long-standing ties since then, uh, which of course then enables a much greater passing on of lessons and cooperation. Um, we need to also look at Colombia's very strong integrity and identity as a nation state. It has a long-running record of democratic governance. It's flawed, admittedly, but it doesn't suffer the same questions about its statehood as, for example, well, many uh, uh, many of the states uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, certainly, Colombia struggled with a, a problem, a conflict in the haves and have-nots, oligarchy and so on. But even then, it did have extremely well-functioning institutions. I mean, there's certainly a potential upon which you could implement the democratic security policy. Um, and to the degree that change was needed, and this brings me to the third caveat, the Colombian state was able to undertake a remarkable reform drive, both of its societal and military institutions and approaches, 
And you haven't really seen that in many of the comparable cases in, in Africa, uh, whether that's because in the case of Nigeria, problems with corruption, uh, or whether it's to do with the military and its role in society historically, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's something that needs to happen before you can implement a, a plan uh, at the level of sophistication that the uh, democratic security policy uh, uh, is. Um, fourth, uh, you have to look at the regional environment in Colombia. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's an ideal regional environment for conflict uh, transformation. Certainly, there's some rivalries and tensions between the allies, as, uh, the, um, the countries there, as I'm sure you're aware. But nonetheless, you don't have the situation as you found, for example, in West Africa between Sierra Leone, Guinea, Liberia, or as you find in uh, around the uh, Great Lakes region of, of the DRC, where conflict sort of moves across borders and it becomes extremely difficult to, to uh, attack that problem. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the particularities that I think we need to remember in this particular case is also Fox's strategic miscalculation. Uh, yes, it is one of the, or it was one of the most sophisticated non-state armed groups uh, of the 20th century, perhaps only comparable really to the uh, Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. But its decision to rely more on drugs than on the people and its attempt to uh, confront the state uh, conventionally uh, other than not, and not through subversion, I think, were two sort of own goals. Uh, it never really mobilized the people in a sort of populist way, and I wonder uh, whether that might have made it a more formidable threat. Uh, that's not to take anything away from the Colombian response, but it does raise questions about um, groups that have that more Maoist feel to them and where the political content is going to be even more elusive and negotiation is going to be even more intractable. So with that, I'll conclude my comments. Uh, thank you again, and I uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And you've helped uh, really set us up to think about um, how the Columbia experience uh, transfers or, or doesn't uh, into Africa context, uh, ticking off a number of key factors um, that were central to the success in Colombia and which remain challenges in Africa, including issues of legitimacy and how important that is for mobilizing popular support um, uh, and a whole of government, whole of people uh, effort uh, to combat an insurgency, um, the issues of capacity, um, uh, being able to deploy forces into marginalized areas uh, sufficiently, uh, robustly in order to be effective, um, the reliance on uh, civil and uh, community defense forces in Africa and how these often go wrong and become part of the problem themselves, adapting um, uh, force structures to meet the specific threats that are required and internal security threats. And um, the issue of how do you reestablish or how do you reconstitute governance in local areas uh, once uh, they've been torn apart by prolonged conflict. So, as I'm sure everybody agrees, there's been a lot put out uh, on the table here among our four panelists. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll use the remaining 30 minutes now to take questions and comments from, uh, from the audience. And we should have a couple of microphones around. And uh, so uh, if we'll take a couple of questions at a time. If you just raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and then introduce yourself and your affiliation, and then uh, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, make your question. So from the back. No need to be bashful, I guess. My name is George Topic. I work here on Fort McNair at something called the Center for Joint and Strategic Logistics. And oddly enough, I would be interested in having um, anyone from the panel comment on the role um, of the logistics modernization and development plans within the Colombian Armed Forces and the National Police um, and its role in, um, in um, getting to um, the points that all of you made um, about you know, essentially winning the peace and, and maybe the exportability of such things um, to Africa. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question in the back here. We'll take two or three. Uh, Sam Green at the NISA Center. Uh, my question is about the, the peace process. Uh, Ambassador Pinzon mentioned a, a peace and recon reconciliation process, but with uh, judicial consequences. 
uh, to me it's almost unprecedented that members of the state that have basically won the conflict would be subjected to this process. So I'm wondering what are the uh, likelihoods that this will be successful and how ex exportable this process might be. Thank you. OK, thank you. And over here, in the up front. Um, Army Captain Ashimalo from 304, three, uh, Civil Affairs Brigade. Uh, my concerns comes down to uh, what Dr. Kilcolin was talking about, the historical perspective of how Colombia got to where they got to, two centuries old of history. And then looking back to Sub-Saharan Africa, the House of Fulani conflict in the Sahelian region, uh, this really goes all the way far, and I hear psychological uh, success after, you know, a canistic operations from, you know, General Davis. And so how do we take it? Because I know the mindsets of the people in that particular part of the world, predominantly the Muslims. What happens is you feel someone is part of your home, say the House of Fulanis. So rather than expose an insurgent, you prefer to be quiet. And this is something that goes all the way far back probably from the time of the Muslim Islamic invasion into that region. So what kind of psychological oppression do they need to undergo if they're able to win you know, the, the physical war and then go on from there into a psychological reset that can actually help stabilize and create stability in that region? It's OK. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll take a break uh, with those questions, uh, and then we'll have time for other rounds. Uh, I'll invite panelists to respond to any of the questions that were raised. Don't feel obligated to respond to all of them. I will get the logistics. Okay. So. Because of the ICAF thing, I'll take the logistics. I'm infantry, by the way. I'm not. I am infantry. The uh, logistics, uh, uh, we had a very uh, old system concentrated on the borders. Uh, depots, the facilities, either they were in the capital city, the big city, or they were close to the borders. So in that specialization already mentioned, we have to move from the standard military uh, organization and move to a really light organization. To give you an instance, we have the uh, mobile brigades. Mobile brigades are composed of uh, four Light infantry battalions, each battalion around 360, 380 soldiers, rifle, riflemen. It's uh, basic infantry units uh, capable of moving at a two-hour notice, they will move. Uh, if in the beginning, if there were helicopters uh, available, they'll do it by helicopter. If not, they'll take regular buses, they'll take trucks, they will take dump trucks, whatever. Uh, uh, just to move. That was at the beginning. It was, so it was no excuse that we didn't have the perfect logistics systems with X amount of transportation companies or something like that. It's, uh, but that was, that was at the beginning. So the light infrastructure allowed us to move units around the country pretty easily. One, one of the problems that we still have is that... Uh, uh, 28th uh, Infantry Battalion belongs to X city. If you're going to take 28th Infantry Battalion from that city, you will have to fight with a lot of stakeholders because you cannot move them because they belong to the city because security now is a concern of everyone. So, so you want to have uh, the thing that provides security to you. You own that, that uh, security unit, that uh, infantry a battalion in this case. So we have mobile headquarters, mobile infantry units, basically infantry with some of the other branches, and uh, we can move them at, a, at any given notice. Now, when you move into a region, you kind of subsume the logistics that are in that place. Uh, food will be provided by the local unit. Uh, money will be channeled through that unit, so your soldiers will be paid. Uh, everything will be done by that unit. So you have to beef uh, that unit uh, uh, logistics pretty, pretty uh, quickly. And we're good at doing it. Uh, every branch is really good at doing it. Uh, plus, if you go 
in, in one instance, big operation, we went to uh, the area of operation of the Navy. The Navy provided everything for the Army units. Uh, I mean, everything was everything. Their depots, uh, their boats, their hospitals, their beds, everything was provided by this, this unit. That's why I'm, uh, I was saying that we're good at conducting joint operations. We're not joint, but we, we, we would like to do it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, General Montilla. I'll invite other panelists to, to jump in again. Just pick up the questions. Do you feel like you have something uh, uh, particular to, to add? I might pick up this question of psychology and focus on um, a couple of different uh, FARC defectors that we had the opportunity to debrief during the research. And I should mention we had the opportunity to speak with, over several field trips, um, more than 300 demobilized FARC. Um, and so getting their perspective on the conflict was actually very important to understanding the psychology. Let me tell you about two of them in particular. One was a woman called Liliana, who I debriefed um, in uh, 2013. She had joined the FARC at 14. She had served until uh, 25. She'd risen to quite a uh, significant leadership position and then had demobilized uh, not because she was a defector, but she was basically a retiree. She wanted to have children, and you can't have kids in the jungle, and she was ready to come back in and stop the armed struggle. But um, this woman still had a very strong belief in the political goals of the insurgency. She had just given up the armed struggle and was thinking about having children and then sort of changing her um, her mode of support for the, um, the ideology. Um, I asked her, why did you take the step of supporting an anti-government movement when you were 14 years old? And she said, well, that's not how it was. Where I was, the government was the FARC. Um, it was just like joining the police or, or becoming a civil servant. It wasn't a politically rebellious act. There was no government presence. It was, it was just that that was the, the power structure. So I think that gets back to something that we talk about in Colombia of the FARC families that control certain areas or that have been, you know, multi-generational members of the insurgency. And breaking that, I think, is not so much about um, the classical psychological operations and the hearts and minds and so on. It's about creating a different pathway for people to, who are not really joining out of political motivation. They're joining because it's a career and that's, that's who's in charge in their area, giving them a, a different pathway. The other guy that I want to mention is a guy called Andres, who I um, debriefed in uh, 2015, who was a member of a FARC urban militia. He was the son of a police officer in one of Colombia's major cities, who basically was just a bored delinquent youth who decided to get into bomb making and being part of the FARC because it was sort of interesting. Uh, and this guy was... Um, probably the, one of the most morally problematic FARC guys that we ever had the opportunity to debrief because he really had no significant political commitment to the goals of the movement. He was just essentially doing it uh, for kicks and had um, stopped supporting the movement and started working with the Colombian government when he was put under direct physical threat uh, and it just made more sense to, I mean, in the, not, in a, not personally, but in the sense that the military operations were closing on in his base area and so on. So I think that tells you there's two sorts of dynamics. There are people who are fundamentally irreconcilable and there's really nothing you can do but put those people under some kind of physical threat to get them to stop fighting um, in accordance with the law, of course. I'm not talking about um, anything outside uh, legality, just talking about military and police operations that make it impossible for them con to continue to fight. I think that's a, actually a very small minority of the people that you're dealing with. The vast majority of people are actually or potentially reconcilable under certain circumstances. And that's where the, you know, the political process and economic uh, means and governability and institutionalization and all the things that we've been talking about come into play. Thank you, David. Go ahead, Dickie. I thought I'd um, just pick up on some of that and then shift perhaps to the third question we got asked. Um, I managed to get to interview the governor of Borno province in northeast Nigeria in September. And that was a really interesting conversation, and I came away very enlightened. But actually, the, the, what he was struggling with was the ability of uh, his um, government to deliver services to the people. 
Uh, and actually, if you look at what's going on in, in uh, northeastern Nigeria, you know, you've got a quite poor, underdeveloped community, seriously affected by the drying up of Lake Chad, uh, a growing population, and mass unemployment. And you know, if you look at the origins of, of Boko Haram, which I think is slightly mistranslated in the West as, you know, a, a hatred of Western education, whether it's much more a a debate about what the Western um, um, whole concept of going to school, getting education, getting employment has delivered. You know, and, and actually, if you're a youngster in northeastern Nigeria, your employment chances are very slim. So his, his view was he was sat on a burning platform with a very short time frame. And actually, it was very difficult to provide the answer, because if the state could provide services and employment and that thing then actually Boko Haram would not have a reason to exist in northeastern Nigeria. Now, that's quite simplistic, and I've shortened the conversation, but, but I think it's not really so much about psychological operations. It is actually about delivering effective governance and employment and economic development, which is part of where the Brenthurst Foundation's next project on cities and rapid growth and urbanization is, is taking us. Um, to answer the question about... Uh, um, the peace process. Um, clearly, when we got back from uh, one of our longer trips to Colombia in uh, February of last year, we were exercised by this. So I arranged for um, Dr. Greg Mills and myself to go to Northern Ireland because a lot of people had talked to us about the Northern Ireland example with great optimism. And I was slightly out of date, so I thought it was worth investing some time. I have to say we came away quite disappointed because here you see uh, the province, you know, umpteen years on from the Good Friday Agreement and peace. And of course, what's apparent now is one of the failings of that peace process was an attempt to draw a line under an event. There was no amnesty. So the police ombudsman, who's been set up actually to make sure the Northern Ireland's police service does a good job, had more than 300 cases against the security forces stretching back over 30 years. And as you went around West Belfast and you discovered that, uh, you know, quite a significant number of families had been forced to move uh, because of sectarian action, and you observed the peace walls, which are still there and higher than ever, you realised that actually you'd shifted into a different form of struggle based around on your interpretation of history, your interpretation of the law, and that we hadn't really tackled the issue I think you were getting at with the question. So, you know, I, my... my message for uh, my Colombian friends has been it's worth having a little good look but I mean there are some do nots as well as some do's from from that peace process I, I think it's really difficult and we've been spent some time discussing this over the last couple of days because ultimately you've got to deal with those people who did bad things but you've got to deal with it in a way that allows the community to move forward and I, I, I have yet to find a really good example of where we've got that right Okay, we can take another round. Bill? Philip Carter with Jefferson Waterman International. Um, we talk about resources given for the plan for the military. Uh, but I'd like to hear about, uh, as you move into the transition, the issue with regard to the police. Uh, one of the challenges we see in Africa is that you'll have, particularly in Somalia, uh, military move in, but there's nothing to be able to hold the town that's been liberated because there's no police force that's there. So the perspectives that you had while you were conducting this effort in Colombia after all this time, the relationship between the military and the police, but more importantly, the resources so that the police could engage with the local communities after the town was liberated. Uh, up here in front. Uh, good morning. I'm Rear Admiral uh, Harry Arubundadi, Nigerian Navy retired. I'm the chairman of Force and Shields Limited. It's a security and counterinsurgency company. Um, I just want to raise some observations about uh, what has happened in uh, Colombia from the general and from the ambassador that shows the focus of the government to get rid of uh, the insurgents. This is one thing we lack in uh, Africa, and I take uh, the case of Kenya and Nigeria as uh, examples. Uh, the, the, the political will has not been there to really get rid of this counterinsurgency. In the case of Nigeria, there's some uh, marginal improvement since the new government came in, 
But in a place like Kenya, it's still business as usual. Then secondly, uh, I'd like to point out again that there is some difference between what happened in uh, Colombia and what is happening in most of the uh, countries affected in Africa. Namely, that while that of uh, Colombia was economic, was based on economic uh, uh, differences or uh, anticipation of uh, values, the ones in Africa are based on religion, on faith. So while the uh, former doesn't want to die because he wants to enjoy the fruits of his labor, the latter wants to die. And what do you want to do to somebody you are fighting who wants to die? So it makes it a lot more difficult for us than uh, it was the case in uh, Colombia. Then lastly, uh, I want to also point out what the effects of democracy on uh, these insurgencies in that uh, the use of force is limited because of uh, international uh, humanitarian laws when you're fighting wars. But if you come to the uh, what we call vigilantes, and you call civil defense forces, they don't have that uh, limitation. And most of the uh, crimes committed by uh, the people fighting the insurgents, not the military, but the civil defense people, because they don't have any laws uh, covering them, uh, commit these atrocities. And unfortunately, in the case of Nigeria, most of them, uh, the atrocities are blamed on the military. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. All right, and then we'll take the one more question over here. And we'll take one more after. Hi, uh, good morning, sir. My name is uh, Tony Renone. I'm with uh, First Information Operations Command in uh, Fort Belvoir. And my question is Columbia-centric. And um, I've been looking at the peace process, and it's supposed to conclude in 16 days. And uh, I don't know if they're on track to do it. They're still talking, and they're making a lot of progress. However, some of the demands that the FARC are making uh, that they want the ELN to be part of the peace process. I agree with that, but the ELN is attacking the Colombian military in Norte Sendendero and other places, and that's that's problematic. Also, the the, the uh, bickering in the in the Colombian political ruling class. Uh, former President Alvaro Uribe, who was very instrumental in in uh, bringing the FARC to police or to the peace table. And now, uh, President Santos, they have these Twitter wars. And I was wondering if they can put aside their differences to, for the good of the Colombian people. And then my final point is, uh, the Colombian military has won the war, won the peace. But I'm concerned about FARC's aversion in, in departments that they control, like Calca and uh, Amazonia's Punta Mayo, and even though the Colombian military and the government is saying that they, have, they want to have an expanded presence there, it just seems like the Colombian uh, government's at a disadvantage because the FARC want to participate in the political process, and they're going to win those departments and have uh, influence in Bogota in the Senate and in the House when they participate uh, with, the, uh, with the government when that comes about. So, I'm concerned that Colombia may turn into Venezuela or something like that if the FARC get a foothold with uh, their political movement. Um, so I appreciate you taking my question, sir. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Julie Conan. I'm with USAID. And I may be the only development person in the room. Oh, there's a few more others. Good. Okay. So my perspective is I've spent uh, a lot of time in war zones like most of us here. Uh, in 2011, I was in Colombia for that third phase that was talked about. My most previous post was in Nigeria dealing with the Boko Haram problem set. So when you have the perspective after working in a country like Colombia where you've seen a progression, you've seen where it's gone from a, a military type campaign to over the years evolving to dealing with things very interesting of a DDR program that allowed for defectors. I had never seen that before. 
uh, a DDR program that, that tried to entice children, child soldiers, to come out. Uh, the political solutions like trying to deal with land and send the land issues, other victims of the conflict, um, protecting people. It seemed to me like a, a plan that evolved over time and probably reflected a realization that no one could kill their way out of the FARC problem, that this was something that needed to be addressed in a lot of different ways and not necessarily head-to-head -head, uh, military actions. So when you get to Colombia with, with Boko Haram, um, sometimes we have the, the wisdom of looking backwards. We can see that there are a lot of things you can do. But when the most immediate challenge, for example, in Nigeria and the Lake Chad Basin is to kind of kill your way out of the solution, um, I'm just wondering if maybe you all can explain the progression in Colombia, because perhaps early on it was killing the way out of the, out of the problem but how that developed and how you could share that perspective with um, those on the African continent, that it's not just a military solution and how your thinking evolved over time that I'm asking the Colombians in order to share that perspective with our African co colleagues. Thank you, Julie. A very good question. Okay, so we're gonna take one more and then that'll, we'll, we'll close off the round and then we'll have the Thank you for uh, taking our response. question. Um, okay, so over the next couple of days... Can you just identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Laura Newton for Caracol TV from Colombia. Um, over the next couple of days, FARC and the government are expected to sign a bilateral ceasefire. ceasefire. Um, from a military standpoint, is this positive, or could this be a concession that's a little too big? So if, if we could hear your opinions on it, and of course, Ambassador Pinsons. Thanks. Okay, great. All right, so uh, we'll turn it over to the panelists again. Pick up those parts that Basel, you feel Basel have something to... to uh, let, me, let me just uh, oh, first, uh, yeah, take, take on, on the only question I will uh, answer, which was presented around here. And, and my comment is very simple. I think that we're here today not to discuss the current juncture in politics in Colombia, but really to discuss what has been happening in, you know, in this history. You know, reality and, and, and what is happening in the process is in the making. And I think, you know, there's right people there in office to, you know, take care, respond, and, you know, take the responsibility for uh, the current events. But what I believe is important for the discussion here is that uh, what has happened in Colombia in the past 15 years, the policies, the efforts, has transformed the situation in a condition or in a, in, a, in a way that has allowed Colombian government, our leaders, our president, to move forward into a peace process. Now, probably there will be later books and chapters on how the peace process happened, what was discussed, and so on, and, and we'll see. You know, but as of today, what is clear is that you know, Colombia did a lot of steps that put us where we are. And I think that's what matters. Junctures in politics are junctures. And it's like uh, trying to define a country for last 98. You know, you cannot do those kind of things. I believe uh, here we're discussing trends. That will be my, my, my comment on to that. And uh, for the rest, I leave, of course, the experts in the panel to come. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bisson. So let's just uh, go across. Um, so uh, um, David, why don't you jump in and then? Okay. Um, so on on the Nigeria comment, if if you look at a badge of the FARC, it has the colours of Colombia, it has the outline of the borders of Colombia, and it has FARC um, People's Army around the outside. That's fundamentally a different set of issues than what you're going to face in. Uh, Nigeria or many of the other places that we're used to because they accept this, the structure of the country. They accept many things about the national identity. They just differ about the form of government. Um, so, you know, you will periodically fight people who simply want to die. Um, and let me say, counterinsurgency is not peacekeeping. If you're doing counterinsurgency and you're not killing a substantial number of people, you're probably doing it wrong, right? Um, it's warfare. But you need to move past that warfare to peace building and to reconstruction and all the, you know, the, the things that make fighting the war um, worth doing in the first place. And I think that's where we're at right now um, with Colombia. 
which gets to the point about um, the peace settlement. I think um, without wanting to comment on anything that I'm sure the ambassador would rather that we don't comment on, I just make a technical observation, which is there's a difference between a permanent ceasefire and a peace deal. A permanent ceasefire, you still have an enemy that has their weapons, controls territory and controls population and therefore probably has a strong incentive in preventing the resolution of a lot of the grievances that led to the conflict in the first place because that's how they derive their power. In a peace deal, you, you don't have those um, conditions and you're actually working together to try to move past the conflict and to resolve the basis that led people into the, the fight in the first place. And so I think while uh, ceasefire is often a very important step on the road to a peace deal, it doesn't substitute for a peace deal. Not even a permanent ceasefire substitutes for peace because it simply um, carries within it the, the seeds of a possible renewed uh, conflict. Um, and the final comment would be on police versus military. And this we can see in the period of the Sword of Honor campaign and the Greenheart campaign, which was the police component of the, uh, of the effort. And the basic idea was that the military would be backfilled with police and civil agencies in areas that it had successfully cleared, enabling the joint task forces that were created under Sword of Honor to move into the FARC base areas and begin to take the fight to uh, the main force of the enemy. That really didn't happen, um, partly because the population didn't wish to see the military replaced by the police, and there were a number of instances where the population actually pushed back and said, no, we want the military to stay. And that made it difficult for the military to then move on. So that at the end of the, the, the period of, of sort of honor two, we find the military still holding significant areas of, of ground and having difficulty in translating or handing them off to civil agencies. The other important thing that happened was a transition from the CCAI, the presidential directed um, Center for Coordination of Integrated Action under President Uribe, to uh, a thing called the GAC, the Com Commander's Advisory Group, uh, later in the conflict. What that represented was civilian agencies not being able to step up and take over the civilian elements of the conflict. So I made the distinction between counter-guerrilla warfare and counter-insurgency earlier. The counter-guerrilla warfare part has worked very well, but civilian agencies, for a variety of reasons, nothing to do with the, the motivation of people in those agencies, just haven't been able to step up and, and fill that gap. And I think that that's where we sit uh, right now. And the risk there is, of course, that the military will be stuck holding ground and unable to uh, move to the next phase. I'm sure General Mantia is going to correct anything I said there that's inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. I think it's uh, on, on the police. The police have been growing at a steady pace. Uh, it is our army, our military forces are half professional soldiers. Uh, and have conscripts. A conscript doesn't, you, you don't need that much money for a, con, for a conscript. It's not, uh, you don't need that amount of money. But to make a policeman, it takes time. It takes a lot of training. They have to uh, learn how to work individually, like any police around the world, whereas uh, an infantry platoon, uh, 35 guys working together uh, fight and maneuver is, is, is pretty standard. It's uh, not much uh, uh, skills needed uh, to do so. So the government, the, uh, the country has been spending a lot of money on increasing the numbers of, of the police. Uh, and the police will get uh, the numbers needed uh, to take over all those functions. So that, that will be the future. As you know, the police belongs to the Ministry of Defense. That is a debate for the future. It's, uh, it's not relevant uh, for the moment because it has, been, it, it has worked wonderfully. The relationship that we have between military forces and our police uh, is, is part of being joint. It's, it's part of all those uh, operations that we conduct in, in a joint manner uh, without being completely joined. The Army is not in charge of the police. Police is independent, independent national police. So the police will get there. Now, uh, like Dave said, is in some instances you have to go and educate the uh, the uh, the town and say we are going to trade you 
uh, 35 riflemen for five policemen. Uh, anyone who, want, who, who, who faces that trade-off says, I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the 31 soldiers uh, without the, uh, the, the, the five policemen. So we'll have ways to go to convince people that uh, you don't need the platoon, that what you need is four or five policemen. Uh, we had a project, a pilot, and it went really well in, in, in a region in Colombia. It really went well. So, so I don't see a, a problem in the future in, in that matter. Uh, the uh, DDR. The DDR is, 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 for me, the tactical level. This is, this is way down here. We're in the strategic uh, center of the world, National Defense University. Uh, but, but if you go down to tactics, uh, the greatest, for me, the greatest program we had, the greatest tool to help us in, in, in our progress is the DDR. The uh, demobilization, disarmament, and rehabilitation uh, process, reintegration process, uh, it, it is just great. It is wonderful. I, I wish I had it when I was a second lieutenant. Uh, uh, like any successful tools, he has many fathers and mothers. Uh, uh, but it's just great. It is a great, great, great tool uh, in, in, in some of the questions on ideologies, religion. And the answer, basically, from my point of view, this is an operator, uh, the one that has to go to the field. My answer is uh, to get demobilized people. Because demobilized people will tell you how is the organization working? What are the ideas? And uh, in your discussions, that which is, by the way, it is called make, uh, collecting intelligence, collecting information, is once you get that intelligence, it will tell you what to do. Because uh, uh, we cannot give you the template of the things that we did. Because as you pointed, uh, uh, this is different. It's completely different. We have had a few instances of people killing themselves uh, just, just a few instances. We, we, we are not really familiar with that. So I cannot give you the answer on how to cope with those issues. But I could give you one of the tools, and the tool is the demobilization process, which brings people that have spent 10, 15 years within the organization, and they're willing to change because it's, uh, they are not married forever to the organization. It's a lot of people that live disenchanted because they want to have a a change, a girlfriend, uh, uh, relationships, the human relationships, and then you can get the intelligence, collect intelligence that will tell you what to do. So for that, it is great. Uh, I don't want to go into deep uh, uh, and, and deep explanation, but basically the success of the uh, tool, it is what it made it so important for us. Is, uh, we love the tool. It is giving us an advantage, a great advantage, and left a door open for anyone with the bad guys to leave the organization. Thank you very much, Tom Matia. Um, David, would you uh, care to add anything to these questions? I just wanted to pick up on a few of the questions that were asked. Uh, I think the, uh, the question of facing a, a religious adversary or one uh, um, fighters who, who seemingly want to die as a form of sort of religious uh, theological self-actualization it's a serious difference, of course, but I think we always have to be cognizant of the difference between leaders and followers. And I think in most of these groups, that type of zeal is not evenly shared across the organization that you're fighting. In fact, I would submit that it probably doesn't represent a large chunk of it. Uh, and I think, as, as David Kulkullen mentioned, if you change the circumstances, if you change the, the channels in which people can move, uh, you will find that I think most people around this world have pretty similar needs and, and respond similarly to, to, to uh, difficult situations. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that out there as a major reason not to look more closely at this particular uh, case. Um, because I mentioned the whole vigilante issue, let me just speak a little bit about that. I think one of the aspects I mentioned, which I want to emphasize again, is the soldados de mi pueblo were integrated within the national command and control of the uh, Colombian military. And that I haven't seen that replicated in any other conflict zone. I mean, the, num any number of uh, counterinsurgency texts 
will look at the use of self-defense forces as an indispensable tool of security at the local level because the military simply cannot be everywhere and the police is often weak or lacking or distrusted or whatever. So it is a fundamental requirement for security, but you want to make sure that you're not trading tactical victory against political loss, precisely for the reasons that you mentioned. So the Colombian achievement in this regard, I think, is definitely worth looking at, but underpinning it lies this ability to mobilize people to work for the state, to be under the command of a a uniform member of the Colombian armed forces. And, and that, I think, speaks again to the political will and the legitimacy of the government and so on and so forth. Um, and then the final uh, question I just wanted to touch upon is this idea of transitioning. And I, I mean, I, maybe I'm misrepresenting the situation, but to my understanding, I don't see a progression in Colombia from uh, seeking to kill your way out of it to then something softer, including sort of DDR and more concerned about human security. I think one of the great um, um, uh, aspects of the democratic security policy is really hinted at in the very name of the policy itself, that is to say a democratic security policy. Security was not about securing the regime, but rather securing the people. And, and as other pe speakers have said, security is the first ingredient. Now, naturally, a lot of people were killed. That is, and again, inevitable. Uh, but I think uh, it's not just rhetoric, and I don't think it's just, you know, for, for shiny government pamphlets. I feel like the gov Colombian government very much oriented their security policies toward the people, that is to say, to enable them to choose a different path forward that did not include the FARC. Thanks. So just some final points to those questions. I mean, I, I do, at face value, I sort of... My starting point was probably in your place to do with, you know, radical Islam, far. This is, is this the same? Is this different? But actually, as I've studied it and thought about it, actually, what you've got in both of those organizations is a mobilizing force that taps into a resentment a bunch about a whole bunch of conditions that are actually the same. So, you know, the, the issue that, that, that gets the poor jungle peasant to join the FARC is actually not that dissimilar to the young lad in northeastern Nigeria who joins Boko Haram. And so actually I do think that, you know, when you look at it from that way in terms of mobilizing forces, actually quite a lot of this is, is, is very similar. Um, I, do, I do have a, um, a difficulty with the sort of expression killing your way out of it because I, I think actually what you need is robust security causing as least damage as possible. Uh, because ultimately the difficult phase that we've talked about is how do you heal all of this and how do you get back to peace? Uh, and I think military commanders have got to you know, get their heads around that and you can see that debate alive in a, a number of, of counterinsurgency campaigns. So yes, you need a robust security response, but at the same time you've got to be conscious that this is the start of a much longer process and you can do um, a lot of damage. Um, I think I'll finish by touching on the peace process um, question. I mean, clearly both negotiating teams are doing what is entirely predictable. They're trying to get the best deal for the people they represent. I think what is um, very interesting about this is, of course, this deal is going to be put to the people in a referendum. Um, I'm from the UK. We're having a bit of a debate about Brit exit at the moment. And I think uh, the role of the media in this in this debate in Colombia is going to be really interesting because actually you've got to have a very educated debate in Colombian society about whether the deal the negotiated, negotiators get to is good for society and represents a sound starting point. I mean, it's not for me as a non-Colombian to judge, but I will watch this debate uh, with some interest. Thank you. Thank you, Dickie. And thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to um, everybody who is here today. We've come to the end of our time. I know there are many other questions, but we're going to have to close it off here. Um, some of the panelists may be available afterwards if you want to try to um, get your questions asked one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, but before we break, um, I just want to applaud uh, the panelists for their presentations. Uh, I think everybody agrees, you know, we heard a great deal of insight um, that emerges from a tremendous amount of experience here at the panel. Um, and uh, it was all very nuanced. Uh, you know, there was no cheerleading and, and uh, um, you know, suggestion that this is the one and only way to move forward. 
um, but really leaving it to us to sort of absorb and, and take with us and apply to the respective circumstances that we're working in. So if you could all join me in thanking the panelists for their wonderful work. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>